Dr. Strecker, I have watched and listened to your presentation, frankly, in awe. And it occurs to me that if only a small portion of what you've been saying is true, that we as Americans have been, frankly, led down the primrose path by those in power who have been giving us information regarding the AIDS epidemic. What you've actually said is that the AIDS epidemic not only did not come from the green African monkey, as we've been told, but in fact was uh, the epidemic itself was started in the 70s in Africa uh, and coincided almost directly with a smallpox uh, vaccination program that's sponsored by the World Health Organization. Uh, and if that's true, the implications of that, of course, are, are astounding. You're also asserting that this disease is not a venereal disease, may or may not be transmitted sexually, possibly can be transmitted uh, outside the body by, by carriers such as mosquitoes. Uh, the virus itself doesn't correspond to anything we know about venereal diseases. The French have isolated this virus and it can live outside the body, another thing we're told couldn't be possible. Uh, we're hearing so much about condoms today as being a good preventative of this disease and you've literally shot holes in that theory. Uh, all these things are astounding. Why in the world would our government, the World Health Organization, the National Institute of Health, lead us down this garden path? What's behind all of this? Um, well, I, I think the answer, the uh, simple answer to that is, of course, first off, if you knew that you'd constructed the virus or had somehow been responsible for its construction or spread, would you tell anybody? I think it's clear that no, you wouldn't want anybody to know that you had anything to do with it. And of course, uh, then the people who are responsible are not going to want anybody to know that they were responsible. So it's, uh, I think it would be naive to suspect that someone would come out and say, hey, I, I made AIDS and spread it. I mean, that's just Yet not you read us documents where it was, the disease was uh, predicted that we're sooner or later going to run into an epidemic, epidemic like this. And then you read uh, a document where it, was, uh, spe where it was proposed, why don't we try and do something like this? And then we have the smallpox inoculation program, and correspondingly in those very same five areas, the smallpox, uh, the AIDS epidemic breaks out. That's correct. And right. then in America, where everybody is lambasting homosexuals as this being a homosexual disease, you've told us that there was a hepatitis B vaccine uh, uh, program. Again, the epidemiology of the AIDS outbreak in the United States, in my opinion, exactly corresponds to the hepatitis B vaccine program. It corresponds not only in the exact age group, the uh, homosexuals in the same cities, in the same time frame, 1978 in New York and in 1980 basically in Los Angeles and San Francisco. So how can our government be telling us that this is a homosexual disease when the disease apparently broke out as a result of this inoculation pro a hepatitis B program because uh, because in fact that's what it looked like from the beginning so I mean that is the easy assumption that it is a homosexual disease because it's growing and running and spreading in homosexuals but that that has uh, absolutely no logical uh, validity in concluding that the homosexuals were responsible for the disease okay I have about 20 more questions <laughs> but there are other people here go ahead well after, after watching your presentation, is there any hope for us? Well, You're yes. talking about how it's doubling right, right. and doubling. Uh, actually, you're right. We're talking about uh, how the virus spreads, what the projections are. If Frank Fenner was correct in the article that he said, what makes a virus eradicable, the AIDS and other human retroviruses probably violate most, if not all, of the criteria that makes these diseases eradicable. eradicable. In other words, they can never be eliminated from humans once they're running in humans. Uh, short of the, the redevelopment or uh, new construction of the RIFE techniques, which might allow for wide-scale uh, treatment of uh, entire areas uh, simultaneously, if in fact what RIFE said was correct, and that was that you could treat a human being uh, by a radio wave that would kill a virus in that human. 
if it requires personal uh, dialysis-like equipment, which would be to hook the human up, take the blood out, radiate it in extracorporeally like they dialyze blood to cure kidney failure, then that is going to be a very costly, slow process. It could be effective, but it's not the way that we're going to save Africa. If that is, in fact, the way that AIDS or these other viral diseases prove to be cured, then I think that, there, that, that there's no doubt that Africa is extinct as a continent and perhaps Asia is well down the same road since they have large portions of their population already infected with HTLV-1, human T-cell leukemia virus. On a practical matter, if I have a child who's in elementary school and uh, in that school there is a, uh, another child infected with AIDS, according to uh, the information you've presented, it would behoove me to make sure my child has no contact with the sick child. Would you agree? That's a very difficult question to answer. I think that if you uh, say that casual contact merely means uh, simply uh, greeting someone or very superficial uh, contact with a person, then the risk of contracting AIDS from that kind of contact are very low. But if casual contact means uh, where a person might be bitten by an AIDS-infected person and breach of skin and perhaps a contact of blood with uh, saliva that could be infectious, then uh, that might be a problem. Uh, if we talk about uh, a person's ability to contract the disease, uh, are we talking again about this dose dependency factor? Could you explain that a little bit? Right, again, the, the, the question, well, uh, it goes back to how is the virus actually getting from one person to another person? And still, I don't find any literature or data that actually tells us how a person one, male or female, has infected another person two, male or female. In other words, whether it's homosexual to homosexual, homosexual to uh, bisexual, or homosexual to, uh, to uh, heterosexual, or heterosexual to heterosexual, there's really no data that says how the virus is getting from the first person into the second person, short of direct transfusion of blood or blood product. Then now, the question is, how many viruses have to be present before the person is infectious. How are they being transduced across from one person to another? And, and at what phase during the, the first person, if he has AIDS, say if I had AIDS, at what course or what phase during my AIDS life am I really infectious? Is it, is it more infectious in the beginning or during the middle of the course or at the end of the course? Those questions, uh, so far as I can tell, have never been answered. All right, so uh, if I were to take a, a t an AIDS test, and test positive with HIV, mm -hmm. what would you say? Did I have a good chance of contracting AIDS? I'd say that, Forget it or, or I'd say that you may have may a not. very good chance of dying prematurely due to that infection. And I think that chance is 100%. I think that 100% of those who get infected with the putative AIDS virus, HIV, human T cell lymphotropic virus 3, will die prematurely. Uh, uh, before they would had they not been infected. From an immune system breakdown? Not necessarily. There are other diseases that could kill you without ever developing AIDS. For instance, a great number of AIDS patients develop AIDS dementia, which is an impairment of mental function. Uh, it's motor impairment, cognitive impairment, and, um, and uh, uh, neurological impairment due to the virus acting on the brain. You can die of that virus acting on your brain before you actually ever develop any of the criteria that might say, well, this is AIDS. Is that the brain rot you were talking about? Yeah, in a sense, that's the brain rot, right? Like Visna, the mother of what I call the AIDS virus. So um, now that the definition has been expanded only recently, well, those, some of those patients with AIDS dementia may well be included. So in AIDS, the definition. But there are other diseases that, like that uh, that could kill you before you actually ever developed AIDS a disease. You see, there's a big difference, at least in definition and practical terms, between having AIDS infection and having AIDS the disease. Many people so far have AIDS infection, but only 50,000 or so have developed AIDS the disease, and half of those are dead. Uh, I think that 100% of those who develop AIDS infection will die prematurely. In, in essence, you're saying that those uh, many hundreds of not only physicians but scientific researchers who have uh, been entrusted with looking into this matter are, uh, in a sense, uh, totally lacking in integrity. 
Or is that my interpretation <laughs> of what you said? Well, I, I'm not sure I can say that they're totally lacking in integrity. Well, are you saying well, they're just not too smart? No, I'm not saying that either. Well, what are I'm you say saying? I'm saying that it is not in their interest necessarily to always tell you the truth. Uh, that is not, I mean, there are certain instances well, that, here. That's where, a lack of integrity. Yeah, yeah. Well, there are certain instances here where I think it's clear that they've been lying. Uh, for instance, uh, to, to say that there's only one AIDS virus. Well, there, there's, that's really not right. There's a field effect. There are millions of different AIDS viruses. Every AIDS virus isolated to date is different. Again, if you made this virus or were responsible for its spread or had something to do with its spread, are you going to tell anybody? I think the answer is obviously no. Well, I, I agree with that. I mean, that, that assumes, though, that there uh, are either a very small number of individuals running the show or that uh, you're a very extraordinary person. Because well, there, there is no one else saying this. Well, that's not correct. There are many other people saying it. Uh, in, it has been, it's been, actually, it's been discussed worldwide. It's only been recently that this question has been discussed in this country. Dr. John Seal of the Royal Society of Medicine has said that the virus appeared to be man-made, in a sense, long before we did, but he couldn't exactly construct how that may have occurred. We sort of gave him maybe the information on how the viruses could have been recombined to produce a new AIDS-like virus. Uh, Jacob Siegel, an East German biologist who said that the virus was constructed at Fort Detrick in a biological warfare project. Uh, again, if the virus is its own constructing agent, and the virus could have arisen in any laboratory at any time, more or less, since the development of human tissue culture, which arose in 1951 with the death of Henrietta Lack, every laboratory in the world is suspect. And of course, that makes all the scientists very nervous because they're going to—they they say, "Well, uh, I mean, I, I surely didn't come out of my laboratory." So, in essence, you're talking about a uh, Chernobyl of molecular biology, in a sense. It's exactly correct. Actually, if you look at the predictions in testimony before Congress, the actual predictions was that a Chernobyl accident uh, or a Three Mile Island accident was predicted by a physicist to be something like one times ten to the minus eighteenth. Uh, and the uh, chance that it would that happen. That it would happen, right. Uh -huh. Whereas the chance of a biological accident of this nature was 1 times 10 to the minus 14th, or basically 10,000 times more likely to occur than either a Chernobyl or Three Mile Island. Dr. Stryker, how can you account for the spread of the AIDS virus in such a monumental amount uh, of cases in countries like Brazil or other parts of Latin America or Haiti? Right. It, again, the, I think the Haitian explanation is quite simple. If you look in the uh, May 11th, Monday, May 11th, 1987 article in the front page of the London Times, what's documented there is that at the time of the smallpox vaccination campaign of the World Health Organization in Africa in the mid-70s, 15,000 Haitians were in that program. In Africa? So, in Africa. Yeah. They were there working. So it's easy to see how Haitians may have been contaminated and then moved back to Haiti. Mm -hmm. That could explain the outbreak of AIDS in Haiti. Did they participate in the smallpox? Yes. 15, they 000, did? Yes, they did. 15,000 Haitians were in the smallpox campaign. Right, well, this is incredible. If, if in fact, the outbreak of AIDS corresponded with this, the smallpox vaccination right. situation in the mid-70s, in Africa, everybody knows about that. Who, who did it? They should know the results. If in fact the Haitians were part of that, and then went back to Haiti, and of course, you know, did what come naturally, and then you know Haitians seem to get it. If in fact a homosexual outbreak in America is tied into the hepatitis B vaccine uh, program initiated by was that NIH? Uh, no, I, I, again, uh, I again, New York, York flu, somebody. Was, New York City Blood Bank. Was Don't these same things occur to the people who did it? I mean, why are you the only one that's making that's making note of this? It's so obvious. I'm not the only. If it one. looks like a rose and smells like a rose, <laughs> it's 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 Actually, pretty much a rose. Right. I mean, they but, they've worked to correct situations based on flimsier evidence than this. So even if they didn't do it intentionally, I think the fact that they're avoiding dealing with this incredible coincidence is tantamount to you know criminal act also. When you say, I mean, uh, well, again, I'm not the only one who has maintained that the virus may have come out of a laboratory. But you're the only one sitting here today. Yeah. <laughs> we can, I mean, it's, right. it doesn't make any sense. Why are you the only one? Broad, well, who else is broadcasting this? Certainly not the government. It should be obvious to them what's obvious to us sitting here. But again, if in fact you see that the people, like, let's look at the WHO. 
the World Health Organization. If, in fact, the smallpox campaign in Africa was responsible for the outbreak of AIDS, that's the last thing they're ever going to admit to. So why would you expect them to come because forward? Because the world's going to die. I mean, everybody's going to die. That's why. I mean, they're humans, too. How are they going to protect themselves? <clears throat> they can't. I mean, according to your time schedule, in 20 years, Amer everybody in America, or less, six years, everyone in America is infected. Could Within be. 14 to 20 years, we're all dead. That's, that's possible. The end of, that's the end of everything. Right. Well, that should get people upset. It should. You're getting me upset right now. I mean, <laughs> yes. I mean, what you're saying is so incredible. We're sitting here very casually and cavalierly discussing it. But you're talking about the end of the world here. And the people well, who can... I'm not the only one talking about the end of the world. Uh, Dr. Hazeltine from Harvard has said in, before Congress that the AIDS virus alone, not taking into account HTLV 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, uh, 1 lookalike, he said the AIDS virus by itself is species-threatening. In other words, it has the ability to exterminate mankind. That's in the congressional record. Uh, obviously, we're on some kind of a countdown here. Somebody doesn't face up to it, or they don't develop a vaccine or some kind of right. help for it. Would right. you say? I mean, I, I, mean, I have always maintained impossible. that there should be a, a, a multi-pronged approach, a crash Apollo type approach, which would include not only traditional uh, therapies like development of AZT and other drugs, but tr uh, development of alternative therapies in a sense, alternative like. Uh, laser therapies, the Rife techniques, and anything else that appears practical because as far as I can see, mankind is headed for extinction unless this virus is controlled. In Latin America and Asia, the disease seems to be spreading. Is it yeah, Latin America, ways? particularly Brazil, uh -huh. the story goes that in Brazil, Brazil bought a lot of the blood that it was transfusing in the 70s from Africa. Oh, and so God, that would explain how Brazil might have incurred a tremendous uh, AIDS problem. The other problem is, of course, that there were IARC or uh, WHO vaccine programs conducted in Brazil. You know, I'd like to get back to this question of culpability here. You said, you didn't suggest, you said that it was, uh, was it the Navy that, that paraded a steamship up and down the... Uh, uh, no, it was the department. It was, well, I don't know if it was, was a, it was a Navy vessel, but it was the department Navy of vessel that conducted... Actually a, sprayed... <laughs> Serratia marcescens bacteria into San Francisco. On being uh, not telling the San not Franciscans telling, telling or anybody else. Right, yeah. Infected everybody, and they got, according to you, 5,000 no, units. That wasn't according to me. That was oh. according to the researcher who conducted according to what the you study. Said, right. The researcher who conducted the study reported that's, uh, that is uh, written in Paxman and Harris, a higher form of killing, which is a review of biological warfare in this country. The researcher that conducted the study concluded that an average San Francisco resident inhaled 5,000 serratia marcescens bacteria during that project, which demonstrated that San Francisco was subject to uh, a biological warfare attack. All right. Well, anybody mm. else got something to say? I was because, uh, say go is ahead. this is an experiment that's gone out mm. of hand. Sure, and now they don't know what Except to that, do. in a sense, we are the experiment. The whole world has become the, the experiment. And uh, the, every person on this planet is now the experiment. Well, I think rather than going back <clears> and trying to file criminal charges or anything well, like that, shouldn't impossible. we just leave that and just go on and try to... Well, sure, there are lots of people who say, well, it's not important where the virus came from, you know. Uh, let's just fix yeah, it. Fix the fault, yeah. not the blame. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I have a story of the African, you know, who woke up one night with a lion in his bedroom. He chased it out. He didn't look for the open window where the lion came in. He crawled back and went, bed, went to sleep, and a tiger came in and ate him. So, you know, I don't believe <laughs> that you can say that it's not important where these things came from. It's extremely important. Okay, during the Middle Ages, uh, the bubonic plague destroyed two-thirds of Europe, or whatever the percentage is, but a large percentage. Right. I believe it was two-thirds or three-quarters. And physicians, or so-called physicians, such as they were at that time, refused to treat patients. If the AIDS epidemic increases all of the proportions we've been discussing here today, how... Where do you see the moral position of a physician who refuses to treat an AIDS patient? Although a lot of them are refusing right now. Right, right. I mean, they're... How do you... Would you, you want to comment on that? Or? Yeah. First off, it's uh, my own... Uh, do you treat AIDS patients? I do. I have 30 to 60 AIDS patients. And I, uh, <laughs> you have well, 30 to 60 AIDS yeah, patients? Yeah. And we treat them, and we... Um, um, I think we do very well in treating them, uh, and I give them all kinds of options in addition to AZT. I don't exclude necessary alternative therapies or other th anything that might help them, I advise that they use, and that includes AZT. But um, what each person will decide for himself is uh, a difficult yeah. question, and each person has his own values and uh, makes his own decisions. Dr. Strecker, this is uh, apparently the last question we'll be able to ask. 
because of time considerations, and I would like to propose this or suggest this to you and see what, what you have to say. There are a lot of people going to be watching this tape, hopefully, if it's a successful videotape. People who are neither homosexuals, neither from Africa, neither drug users or anything else, whose only exposure to the information about AIDS comes from the media or from the government or so-called experts. And they really haven't been too concerned about this. But after watching this tape, they might very well become you know, very concerned about this. And you have people that are trying to live normal lives. They are raising children. And a child, after all, in my opinion, is actually, among other things, a sign of faith that two people bestow upon humanity. They say, I'm bringing forth this child in the hopes and expectations that that child will live as good or as decent a life or better than they have had. With the prospect of what you're saying coming true in any part, what, do you, what would you say to that person or those people or that couple watching this program? Why well, would you leave this? I would think that they have to continue on in their living as uh, if uh, what we predict in a sense is not necessarily the final uh, outcome. Uh, that isn't to say that it can't happen, but what I mean to say is that we have to work to make it not happen. Each person has to become involved individually. This virus threatens the existence of everyone on this planet. You have to become involved and determine for yourself whether or not what we're telling you is true or false. It doesn't take a rocket physicist to look out there and say, hey, there's a whole bunch of new diseases which all of a sudden seem to have popped up. And so people have to become involved and find out exactly what's going on. They should not just accept everything they're being told by the so-called AIDS experts in government as absolute fact. You have to decide for yourself whether what we've told you is true or false and then become involved with your, your neighbors, your friends, your representatives, your senators, and your president. And if you do that, then hopefully we'll get to a solution. I think there is a solution. I've, uh, I've already illustrated what I think the solution to this problem is. But I think that this country, the whole world, has to address it in a crash program of many-pronged approach. As time passes, you will see more and more of Dr. Strecker's warnings and predictions come true. Unfortunately, at this time, there is no happy ending to this story. Assuming the government does not interfere with Dr. Strecker's work, there may be, just maybe some hope for us. Dr. Strecker and others that share his concerns are committing all their time, all their efforts, and all their resources to finding a solution. And that includes exploring any conceivable alternative that might stop this disease, instead of waiting for the drug companies to produce a miracle vaccine. Now, nobody is asking you for money. You've already contributed to this cause by purchasing this tape. But there are things you can do. To begin with, tell everyone you know about Dr. Strecker and his findings. Tell the politicians you elected that you're not satisfied with what you're being told. Tell them it doesn't make any sense to entrust the cure for this disease to the same people who may have started it in the first place. The same people who haven't found a cure for cancer after 40 years of trying. Mankind doesn't have another 40 years. Tell them that God gave you the gift of life, and now that gift is being threatened. Tell them that you want to live, and that you want your children to live. Tell them now, before there's no one left.